floor. Glad to see you here. Um, this is Stephanie Merrifield from our Digital Underground, who's getting this set up to stream on Facebook and YouTube. And then she's going to leave because she's got to work the reference desk. She's multi-talented. Um, our presenter, John Rondeau, has presented for us before on weather and something else, too. I can't eBay. Remember. eBay, yeah, probably some other things. Um, but it's been a while. So we're glad John is here. Well, I just want to mention that his wife, Marilyn, worked at the library for... 32 years. 32 wow. years upstairs at the checkout desk. So I'm sure oh, you saw there. Yeah, about that. that yeah. Oh, yeah. She's Flowerhouse, that's for sure. So thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. A little bit about me. My name is John Rondo. The team is very silent. I'm not a native of Bartholomew County. I grew up in Fort Wayne. But I've been here 55 years, so I consider myself a semi native. I worked at Cummins for 41 years and retired in 2008. I've always been interested in history, and I'm talking back to grade school. So it was very obvious when I got here I was going to get involved in the history of this beautiful place. And I have been involved with uh, Historic Columbus. We do a show. We did a show until the pandemic. Every September, we did two days at the library. and. Uh, I would have, this was new in 2019, but I had the whole red room full of my junk. And I do call it junk, it's collectibles. And, and I mean, it goes back 100 years or more. I'm going to cover two subjects today trains, interurban streetcars. And I also have back here on this table, I have nine pictures that were taken by Evelyn Seward. I'm sure many of you remember Evelyn. She took those pictures in 1953 from the top of the courthouse. And if you look at them, one through nine, it's like she did this. All right. And I have tagged as many places on those as I can, because if I didn't, you wouldn't even have any idea what you were looking at. The town has changed so much. A couple of things that I want to do. This might seem simplistic, but I'm going to do it anyway. Streetcars. Streetcars basically run within a town. And they started out as open cars that were either horse or mule uh, driven. In about 1892, they went to electrification. So. This is a very early one. This is probably about the summer of 1893. It's the John Crump Street Railway. This, you can see in a few years, how they modernized. The cars became very, very nice. This is one that's actually sitting in front of the old Belvedere Hotel, where the county office building is now. The interurban. Just like the interstate, interurban, it runs between major towns. But I'm going to pass this around and you can look at it. This shows where the interurbans went. Every town of any size in Indiana had the interurban. You could get on anywhere in Indiana and get to anywhere you wanted to go. The main hub was in Indianapolis at the Traction Terminal. And there were hundreds of internet, uh, internet urban cars that came into that traction terminal every day. Trains. Well, trains, they haven't really changed. They've gone from steam, probably from woods to steam to, to uh, diesel. But a train is a train. The train came to Columbus in 1844. <coughs> So the people who complain about the train whistles, <laughs> they ain't seen nothing yet. Because there used to be 27 steam trains a day in 1920 went through this downtown area. And I mean literally through the downtown area. How many? Mm -hmm. How many? 27, 27 steam trains, 45 interurbans, and untold number of streetcars that ran on an hourly schedule. So it, it had to be wild. Interurbans and streetcars running down the middle of Washington Street. 
a train going diagonal across Fifth and Washington. If you remember, they had the buildings that had the slab sides, and you said, what's that for? Railroad went right through there, across the street from here where First Christian is now. That was a railroad yard. A complete railroad, railroad yard with stock pens and warehouses and everything else. It's right in the middle of town. <laughs> there were two railroad stations in town, one at 3rd and Chestnut, and one at 7th and Jackson. And all these trains came through the downtown area. So it, it had to be uh, just with soot and smoke and all that kind of stuff. I, I just can't imagine what it would be like. I picked 1920, and I, I picked the date, because it was the heyday of public transportation. The roads weren't very good yet. Cars weren't very dependable. People wanted to get out and go after the First World War. And so it was, it was when it was at its height. And a lot of people don't realize that the interurban started about 1895 and ended here in 1941. September the 8th, 1941. And I am a firm believer if it had lasted three more months when Pearl Harbor was bombed and then you couldn't get tires, you couldn't get cars, if we'd have had the interurban then, during the war, we'd still have it. A little bit of information for you. When the railroad reached Columbus in 1844, there were less than a thousand people here. In 1920, the date of all this stuff, it was less than 9,000. So it was still a very small town, but the railroad is what probably made it because then the, the different factories came here and those kinds of things. Current population is 50,000 according to the, according to the census. I'm not going to uh, describe the trains in a whole lot of detail because trains are just trains. They've been here 180 years and they've changed, but they still do the same thing. We have one railroad still runs through, still run on the main line that came here in 1844, and that's the Louisville in, in Indiana. It's been here for about 25 years. Like I said before, Railroad Square was across the street. <clears throat> and I can't imagine having sock pens and warehouses and trains and everything in a residential area. Because I've got a picture that shows the Prowl House, the Irwin House, and the uh, Carnegie Library. There's this, there's this Railroad Square with all that commotion going on. I always ask. Does anybody remember the interurban? And every once in a while I'll have somebody who said, yeah, I remember it. I said, I'm going to put you on the spot, but uh, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm 81, and it was gone on my first birthday. That was the last time that an interurban ran in this part of the, of the state. It was September the 8th, 1941. So... They may remember it from their parents talking about it, their grandparents talking about it, but actually to see one or ride one, I don't think so. John, is that one stopped running in most of the state? It was know? it was shutting down in the 30s. Okay. Seymour to Louisville shut down in 1939. There was one car still running on the Seymour to Indianapolis leg. It had an accident at Azalea on September 8, 1941. Uh, it was a situation where a the last car running broke down. They sent a maintenance vehicle from Columbus and didn't realize that he had gotten gone, gotten going again, and they came together. There were, two, I think, two fatalities, and that was it. That was the last time anything ran on those tracks. Uh, Joseph Irwin is the one that actually started. I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, interurban, interurban here. He, uh, 
he started most of the inner urban in this area and then it changed hands and i have all that information here it's how it changed hand and who owned it and those kinds of things but uh as i said during 1920 45 inner cars ran through columbus every day there were multiple stops in bartholomew county i think there were 21. as you go north toward indianapolis you see stop 11 stop 12 stop 13. That's where, those were in urban stops and they just numbered like i think we were like 43 through 62 or something and that would county coming from indianapolis going south the interurban in bartholomew county paralleled the pennsylvania main line which the pennsylvania main line is still there and you can still see if you're up on the humpy what we call the humpy bridge there on national road where the train yard is off yeah, to yeah, the yeah. southeast there if you look at the telephone poles they're set off 20 30 feet well the thing is the interurban ran right behind side on east side of the main line they paralleled each other until it got to about 13th street or maybe a little bit north of that where newsom is there was a bridge across the, the river there it went up newsom turned south on washington went south on washington to second street second street out about i'm going to say a little past chestnut and then turned south and went down to Xavier. So they had a double wide tracks, two sets of tracks about 13th Street so that the, the streetcars and the interurbans could pass on Washington Street because they were all using the same territory. Were the tracks for the railroad and the interurbans different width? Good question. I don't think so. Okay. I think they're uh, they're probably standard gauge, okay. but that's a, that's a guess on my part. Yeah, okay, that's, probably, that's a question that I need to. Of all the books I've got, I, I haven't seen anything that said any different. Uh, <laughs> just I know. Thank you. So was, so the, the, John, was the interurban right away marked by those power lines? I don't know that it's marked, but I know they redid some street crossings, some railroad crossings in Edinburgh last year. The tracks were still there. They were still in the ground. It seems like I have read somewhere that as Public Service Indiana came into being and the interurbans went out of, they bought the interurban right of ways to run power lines between the towns. It was the early days of electrification. And I don't know, you know, as you go up 31 towards Taylorsville, you can see that, that line of poles. That, yeah. And, um, and I wondered if that was the interurban right of way. It would be to the west of those poles, that line of poles. So it'd be between that and the main line of the Pensy. And I'd say Pensy. Sorry. My grandfather worked on the Pensy in Pennsylvania for his whole life. So all I ever knew was Pensy. <laughs> That's the Pennsylvania Railroad, so I won't say it over. over. That's all right. <laughs> the street railway, as I said, runs just in town. And Crump started that in the, about 1890 and found that it, horses and mules <laughs> didn't do a very good job of pulling the streetcars. So about three years later, they electrified it, and their electrical power station was at the corner of 16th and Chestnut, right on the, would have been on the southeast part of the cemetery. The, the automobile is credited or whatever for making the demise of the of the interurban people said well if i can drive my own car to indianapolis why am i going to ride a street or an <clears throat> interurban street cars the same way it went on a certain path if you wanted to go someplace else it didn't go there so you either end up walking or doing whatever there were eventually three routes on the uh, on the street railway there was the east columbus route that went out of Indiana and turned around 
there was the the main route, which was Third Street to Chestnut or Sycamore. They moved it over the years, <laughs> and they go up to the power station and turn around. And then the third one was in the Orinoco route just because of the furniture factory and those kinds of things over there they had a short line that went and they call that the orinoco i mentioned the uh, power station at 16th and sycamore give me a little more detail and if you have questions please please stop me first electrified was in may of 1893 for the street rail street railways the line was sold already in August of 1904, so they didn't stay in, in business very long. And it actually discontinued running totally and went to buses in 1932. So it's, the streetcars didn't last 30 years. The main route was Crump's Theater on 3rd to Sycamore. North on Sycamore to 16th, west on 16th to Washington, and south on Washington back to Crump's Theater. You got to realize in 1920, the city limits was probably 13th Street, I would guess, because I know 16th Street didn't come into being in the city until in the 20s sometime, or maybe even 30s. The hospital was built in 1917. It was out in the middle of no place. That's the reason they call it Bartholomew County, rather than the Columbus Columbus Hospital was over on Fifth Street. Garland Oak Cemetery was out in the country. And, and then as Columbus grew, they just sort of grew around those things. It took years, but it happened. The Maple Grove line branched off at 7th and Sycamore, ran east through the Maple Grove addition to Hutchins Street. And you, when we get, if I get done blabbing here, you can come up here and look. And I've got these all mapped out here. Yoronoka was a short line. The East Columbus line went. Uh, out State Street to Indiana to Cherry and turned around. A lot of the, a lot of the electrifieds, when they had the wires up above, they would just reverse them and the car just wouldn't even turn around and just go the opposite direction. With electric motors, you can do that. You don't have to run in reverse. Okay. Any questions about streetcars? Let's talk a little bit about the inner urban. There were stations at Taylorsville, Columbus, and Azalea. 21 stops in Bartholomew County. The passenger station was at 3rd in Washington on the, where the Commons is now. So you can imagine people were trying to get on the inner urban in the middle of Washington Street. Of course, there weren't many cars then, so we're probably all right. The car barn maintenance shops was on 1st Street behind where City Hall is today. And I've got a map here that shows exactly how that was set up. It ran south in the middle of Washington Street. It came down what is now Newsom Avenue to get to Washington. And you can see, you can still see the abutments for that bridge. I have aerial views that show, and you can still pick out the, the abutments for that bridge. But you, if you look at a 1949 aerial map, the bridge is gone, but the abutments are there. So they somehow tore it down. It became the uh, Indianapolis, Columbus, and Southern in 1902. Great first interurban entered Columbus in September of 1903. First Columbus to Seymour was in October of 1907. Then they leased it to public service in 1912 for 999 years. 
I think that's pretty interesting. It was reorganized. And then the uh, Indianapolis to Seymour was abandoned in September of 41 after the fatal accident. Seymour to Louisville had been discontinued two years before that. So it was dying very rapidly. I have been doing some work on a, a project for a lady that lives up in Hendricks County. She is old enough that she rode. She rode the interurban to Indianapolis to work. So she wanted to know what it was. So it's the Terre Haute, Indianapolis, and Eastern was that interurban system. And so I've been doing the same kind of thing for her to try to get her more information about, about what she remembers when she was a girl. I think she's she's 95 now, I think now. So she, she had a good chance of writing the, the interurban. Okay. We're going to talk about the Pensy. There were three of them, three branches in Columbus, in Bartholomew County. The main line, which ran from, it ran from Taylorsville, Columbus, Wellsboro, Wayneville, and Jonesville, <clears throat> became, began, began operation in the 1840s and reached Columbus in July, July of 1844. So people that complain about the railroad coming into their territory, if they haven't been here at least 175 years, <laughs> it's the other way around. The railroad was here and you build up about it, uh, uh, around it. If you go north on any of the major streets here, Pearl, Sycamore, Chestnut, between 14th and 15th streets, this big hump, that was a railroad track. And they said, well, why in the world would they put a railroad track between 14th and 15th Street? They didn't. They put, <laughs> put a railroad through there and the town built 14th and 15th Street on either side of it. But that railroad didn't last very long. But now we've just got this big hump in the street. But I have to admit, when I first came here, I said, what is that big hump for? <laughs> well, when I started figuring out what it was. It's at, this uh, main line is operated since 1994 as the Louisville and Indiana. And then the Madison branch is an interesting one. It ran through Elizabethtown. And in fact, Elizabethtown was the first town in the county to get the railroad. And it was in early of 1843. There's a monument after that. Mm -hmm. What's that? They got a monument after that. Mm -hmm. it, it ran diagonally across Washington, as I said. If you see some old pictures, especially from the 40s and 50s, it's very prominent. The buildings were built on the diagonal. It was abandoned in, in 1971. So I moved here in 1966, and the Madison branch still ran through Elizabethtown and on down to uh, on down to Madison, and it wasn't very long after we moved here that that they tore up the tracks and it was gone. The third one is the Cambridge City branch. It ran through Farmerstown, which is a ghost town, and you'll see that if you go back and look at, at old railroad maps and that you got towns that are not there anymore. And I I did a study for the library a couple of years ago about the ghost towns of Bartholomew County. And what we found is the town would be here, and the railroad came here, they picked up the whole town and moved it over to the railroad. Now isn't that's how old St. Louis and St. Louis Crossing was yes, exactly. like on 800 North. Yes. Yeah. I always heard that story. I'm like, what? <laughs> it ran through Clifford and there was there was a station at Clifford. It ran through Hagersville, which is another ghost town, and St. Louis Crossing in, uh, in Bartholomew County. There is a stop listed at Lambert Station. I have not been able to verify it at all, but I believe it was near the present airport, east of Mar Road and south of County, County Road 400 North. Okay. I read about a Lambert station, but 
Some are too married. I mean, that's your country. Yes. It's out there on Sons Drive, Sons Road. Uh, uh, you go up Mar Road and turn on that, and, and it crossed right there. There, as I understand it, there was a coal yard there. There was livestock pens there, and there okay. was a church there, and it burnt. The church burnt. And if you go back to the 1880 newspapers, you know, there's a story about the church. At Lambert Station. Yes, sir. Thank you, Robert. I really appreciate that. What I always say when I do one of these things, I try to learn yes. from the people that are here because I guarantee I don't know everything. <laughs> I will do research and I'll go hunt stuff down, but nothing's better than someone saying, oh, I know that. <laughs> that saves me a lot of legwork. <laughs> That ceased operation and was abandoned in the in the 1960s. During World War II, there was a spur that ran off of that into into the airport when they were building building at that point the collar or whatever they call it, the collar air base. I think it first they got named the Atterbury somehow. They feel like they, they did. They yeah. had it, it was the Atterbury Airfield, and then became a collar but I have researched that and I know where that spur went because uh, Bill Stahl wanted to know he wanted to know where that spur was I think he might want to go hunt it down or something. but it really ceased operation after uh, World War II next one is the Westport branch of the Milwaukee route And uh, Milwaukee route is the Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, and Pacific. It stopped at Azalea, Elizabethtown, and Grammar. All had stations. Interesting, interesting one. It crossed the Madison branch of the Pennsylvania at the south end of Elizabethtown. Literally like that. There were no signals. So trains from either or any direction had to stop before they could proceed through that crossing. And I have a picture of it. It's, it's really strange to see two railroad tracks, and I mean, literally, it's crossing like that. Sounds like right down the middle, right downtown Seymour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, it ceased operation in January of 1961. So. All this stuff is 60, 70 years of these spur lines and those kind of things. And the third one is the Columbus, Hope, and Greensburg. That's part of what they call the Big Four system. <coughs> Their depot was on the south side of 3rd Street between Sycamore and Chestnut. And Cummins purchased that depot in March of 58. So by March of 58, that railroad was already gone. It began operations in May of 1884 and was abandoned in 1973. Not right. Yeah. Now, okay. these maps show where these various these various railroads are. So you have the Milwaukee route, Westport branch, coming up through Azalea, through Elizabethtown, and on to uh, Decatur County. The main line is here, of the Pennsylvania. This is the Cambridge route, went between 14th and 15th Street, headed north. The Columbus, Hope, and Greensburg left 3rd third, third and Chestnut, parallel the uh, Columbus of Cambridge City branch till north of where National Road is now. Now, National Road was in the appointed place until the 1940s. But where Fazoli's is now, those two railroads were side by side. Yeah. And the Cambridge branch 
went straight north. Columbus, Oakland, Greensburg went out through Rugby and, and uh, some little towns out there. So what I'd like for you to have time to do is come up, take a look at this stuff, ask questions, uh, make comments. If you know something that I haven't put here, I'd like to know it because I, I change this as I get more information, as I do more research. So the pictures in the back there are for uh, Evelyn Seward's Columbus 1953. I bring those every time because people just find it very interesting how the town has changed. This was prior to redevelopment and all that kind of stuff. So please come up, like I say, ask questions. If you have questions now, you can even do that. I'll take any questions right now. So third and chestnut is where Papa's is or was. Right in that area. There. Yes. Okay. In between second and third or more to the third? It was on the it was on the third street okay. side. Okay. Where the gas station is. Yeah. yeah. In that area, but it'd be on I believe it was on the south wow. side of the street. Anybody else? Any comments? You spoke about the, the big interurban depot in Indianapolis. I think they had nine tracks running in and out of that thing. I, but I read 200, 200 interurbans a day while we were there. Yeah. What I always like trains, and I heard from my family, I told him earlier about my mom, grandpa, and grandma, and two of her cousins. Mom went for each project. And her reward was go down on the interurban to uh, to Louisville and go on what's now the Bell of Louisville, same boat, different name, run up and down the river, come back, <laughs> go on, on the interurban, come home. And I heard mom and grandma talk about that trip and the fun they had and everything. <laughs> so I heard about the interurban long for, you know, I mean, forever. One, one thing that I have did bring here today, <clears throat> this is a schedule from September of 1940 which is the end of basically the last year of the inter, interurban. And it's really amazing. Uh, leave Columbus at 5.20 in the morning and be in Indianapolis at 6.45 downtown Indianapolis. My mm -hmm. guess is that they didn't have a lot of people that they stopped to pick up, it was quicker than that and it cost you two bucks. Wow. Great. Yeah, great. Bring it back. <laughs> so they run like 60, 70 mile an hour, didn't they? they some of the some of the what they call the fast rails do did. Mm -hmm. I have seen some that are called the Crandic Comets out in Iowa, and they would race airplanes with them. They, wow. they would get they would get up to a hundred and ten miles an hour. Well anyway, back to the nice. big barn there off of what was the street? It's off the circle. Yeah. In Indianapolis, what was that street it was on? Market. Okay, thank you. Between the Circle and the uh, State House. Yeah. Well, anyway, I'm a race fan. I worked at the Speedway for 25 years and helped us print cars and this, that, and I'm talking about. But anyway, always liked racing. Well, in 67, they made a movie at the Speedway, among other places, called Winning. Paul Newman and whatever was in it. Well, it, it come to the Indiana Theater. They're on Warsaw Street with Cinerama. You remember those days <laughs> and had to go see that so my wife at the time had a almost new 66 Murphy Comet Cyclone GT she said well we'll take my car but you got to drive because I know nothing about Indianapolis I didn't know much I knew where the Indiana theater was so anyway we, we went by the theater and said well there it is okay where did we park well we went around the block and stopped and there was a, a big opening there parking like 50 cents or a dollar or something so we'll park in there and seen the movie come back out Got the car and left, but that was the interurban barn, and they had mm -hmm. public parking in there for a long time. Yeah. Oh, was cool. was there a big office building? Was that still been there as late as 1966, 67? I, I don't know. My parents and I used to come from Fort Wayne to go to the 500. Good for them. And we started. Or I started. I think the first one that I saw was probably <clears throat> 1954. Who won that year? One year before too. I got killed the next year. Oh yeah. Kill Hoover Bitch. 
still with the bench. But he should have won the 52 wins. Yeah, but what we would do <laughs> is we would come to Indianapolis, park downtown, get on the inner urban yeah. or whatever there at the barn. Union Station. It, actually, it was trains at that point. Yeah, yeah. And take a train out to the. Come on, anyway, so they couldn't have to drive out there yeah. with all that crowd. Yeah. Did you know? I'll get off on this tangent and tell me to shut up if you want to. <laughs> did you know when they? Did you know who really came up with the idea from from the Speedway was Carl G. Fisher from Greensburg. That was his idea, and he got some other people going with him. He also uh, developed Miami, Florida. Yeah, yeah, it's very good. He was one of these guys. He got turned on to something that got going. He, he was done with it. He also spent a lot of time with Lincoln Highway. He was into tinkering lots of pies. But anyway, we looked around and where to fill this. There's going to probably have a five mile track and maybe a three mile track, but they can only get enough land eventually to make a two and a half mile track. We all know love now. But one of the places they went because they had accommodations there, they had trains that come in, and that was French Lake. They thought about building the speedway at French Lake. And I couldn't find any flat ground. Well, the thing of, yeah, but what really killed it. As they talked to the city fathers of French Lake and West Baden, said, Hey, we're wanting to build this racetrack there. Da, da, da. And they said, oh, Okay. Well, all the main customers at French Lake and West Baden were gamblers and hoods mm -hmm. out, of, out of Chicago. And they talked to the, the clientele and they said, Ah, that's the reason we get out of Chicago to get away from this, that nonsense. And we don't want crowds and stuff. And French Lake said, Forget your racetrack, we're not interested. So, for your information. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Anybody back there have anything? What were the accommodations on the interurban? There were dining cars. Yes. There were sleeper cars. Yeah. I don't know why you would have a sleeper car when you can go from Indianapolis to Louisville in about three and a half or four hours. I don't know, but there were sleeper cars. Mm -hmm. um, there were freight mo what they call freight motors. <clears throat> they didn't carry passengers at all. They just carried strictly freight. So it was it was pretty widespread the mm -hmm. capabilities of the of the interurban. And they are just single cars, but every once in a while you'll see a tandem. You'll see two or three of them hooked together because they have a big enough crowd, like for uh, uh, if going to the 500 or sure. going to Cincinnati or well, whatever, they would, think, they would put multiple cars together. I think they, they did crowd. that when mom went to Louisville with the family. I think there was like three or 400 kids went that day. I got pictures of them all getting on the train. Yes, yeah, so there's some pictures the someplace that show sure. on 2nd Street a tandem mm -hmm. and people getting on, going for some kind of doings. What is that thing at um, French Lake? The that West Bay? Oh, oh yeah. what is that? I don't know. No. They got a railroad museum type thing there. But the, and you, the one that you get in and ride on, what is that? that that's when it goes by Larry Bird's house and they, they just come back. Now, I think they've got another deal where you can get on a train and they have like a simulated train is stuck up by the robbers and stuff. I think they go to Jasper or something like that. French Lake Scenic Railway. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Anybody might be interested in coming up and looking at this stuff? I'll be up there in a minute. Thank you, John. Appreciate you, your time. Appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you.